So this is for advance. Oh, thank you. So from, from the music, uh, I would like to open with uh, a poem or a reading that um, I think is appropriate for the framing of, uh, of, of my talk uh, with each of the season's talks from uh, spring in Bogota to summer in Monterey, Mexico to autumn here in Toronto. I've chosen a, a, a reading or a, an author that is, is, is appropriate to the topic or the place. And I probably could have chosen Margaret Atwood maybe, but I wanted a poet. And I think this is, this is where I want to go with, with this evening's talk that we've lived with complexity for thousands of years. We've understood what it is. And um, Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching, and this is from Ursula K. Lorenz, a translation of it. Um, chapter 58, living with change. When the government's dull and confused, the people are placid. When the government's sharp and keen, the people are discontented. Alas, misery lies under happiness, and happiness sits on misery. Alas, who knows where it will end? Nothing is certain. The normal changes into the monstrous, the fortunate into the unfortunate, and our bewilderment goes on. So the wise shape without cutting, square without sawing, true without forcing, they're the light that does not shine. Um, it's typical to have um, a personal or position statement um, because this is a talk about complexity and systems, but also temporality and the uh, and the range of crises and how we might address them. I'll say why I am here um, is that where else would I be? Um, I mean, so this is the 12th year, 12th year RSD 12. Um, the last time we held a relating systems thinking and design in Toronto was 2016 for RS, RSD 5. And it's just really amazing to have people back here again. So. Um, uh, back here in OCAD at, at one of the 13 hubs. And so why, why else I am here um, as a, I, I call myself a revisionary, a pathfinder human spirit for design to revitalize culture. And my, uh, I am a, my ancestors um, are, are settlers, but not necessarily. So I'm a settler in Canada from the United States. And if I go back um, a little bit further in my history to the 20th, 20th century and just before then, my mother's side were, were um, Eastern European Jewish immigrants, but my father's side uh, were in the American Revolution. They were in the uh, witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts. They were explorers that, not pilgrims, but explorers that landed in the Massachusetts Bay and, 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 and and fought for Maine against Canada and the Father Rails War. The, um, so the, there's a lot of controversy. Going back further, uh, there's an ancestor signed to Magna Carta, Thomas de Moulton, and so they were Normans. So I've been exploring in, in my blood, and um, I'd say systemic design has grown out of our explorations through through uh, my history in software and system design, uh, human computer interaction, I actually go back to the early 1980s before my, before my master's and working with the usability lab era at IBM and developing uh, with, with others, um, the attempt for transformation design in around 2005 to 2010. And when that didn't really take shape, it, came back as systemic design a few years later in collaboration with um, Berger Savaltson, uh, Harold Nelson, and other people as RSD formed. So as I talk about <clears throat> managing complexity, let me start with defining complexity as could say it's a, I see it simply as, and, and this comes from kind of common definitions we're using in, in research in, um, in the work that I'm doing with actually um, um, uh, Greg Lubier and, um, and the Veris Institute. Complexity is the degree to which a large system of constant dynamic processes are deeply interconnected with a higher number of interconnecting relationships and feedback between them, leading to an emergence of coherent patterns. 
and unexpected outcomes. So emergence out of complexity, being able, difficult to tease it apart and understand its sources. But also, um, I would say there's another definition which actually gets to what Griff was pointing to in his uh, talk in the, his piece in the panel discussion, which comes from John Warfield's uh, paper from 2001, that he believed that complexity was all in our heads in the sense that it, it referred to the, the state that of the frustration that occurs when people cannot understand a problematic situation is a great of importance to them. And by, by that, he means that if we didn't think the situation was a matter of concern, we wouldn't care that it was complex. We wouldn't name it as such. And, and the label of complexity comes out of the psychological frustration of being able, unable to apprehend the relationships that lead to the outcomes. And Warfield was a engineer and a scientist, I would say something of a critical realist type, but he had an ideal that people through dialogue and structured deliberation could understand the sources of complexity and identify better uh, approaches to any type of problem solving, regardless of the, uh, of, of the situation. He was uh, quite a methodologist and he was the partner with, with uh, my mentor, uh, Aleko Skostakis. So why Olsen here is that um, over, there's a long-term issue that I think is ignored at our peril that is <clears throat> related to the decline of trust and the decline of competence in many of the Western institutions and, the, and what we call institutions that we rely on in all types of decision-making and, and that we count on for managing, if you will, the complexity at higher orders that we assume are taken care of. Bruno Latour, in one of his later works, 2013, An Inquiry into Modes of Existence, opened the book with these statements, which I just thought would be easier to, to paste in so we could just see the shocking question addressed to a climatologist obliges us to distinguish values from the accounts practitioner, practitioners gives of those. And so it's it, it comes back to in, in the um, variety of the modes of ontology, that modes of existence are the ontologies that uh, exist in, in modern society. And for here, Latour, who is really uh, dealing with and finding ways to work with postmodernity, is representing as an anthropologist, if you will. Um, how, how, how moderns live, like the ontologies from, um, from science and the arts and law and government and, and startups and uh, what he called double click, which is like um, Silicon Valley speak. I mean, he tried to present these, these different ontologies that we live within as ways that we could, uh, that we could um, start to look at how we could build trust together and talk across these, not just epistemologies or how we know knowledge, but the ontologies or the how we actually live and exist. I'd say that with Western and global institutions, our challenge, and this is part of this is essential to managing complexity, is to clarify the sense of suitable integrity to warrant public trust. So whether that's competence, um, Clarity and transparency, or the or cutting through complexity. There are many aspects um, inherent in the institutions and and in our um, public representation of. So I can't pro promise an answer, but I will um, pr present some uh, uh, some different slices of the system that I uh, that I hope will get to a, a ways some principles and approaches that we can. Um, put on put on as an agenda for systemic design to address this. So, so I mentioned postmodernity and complexity and crises comprise postmodernity. This is this is the this is the sea that we're in, and you know, and, and it has been it has been so since at least two thousand. And for those of you who are in the nineties, we didn't even worry about crises then. There were things going on, we just didn't worry about it. A generation since 2000 has known nothing except 
and turmoil and, cri and crises and uncertainty that has resulted from that. Um, and as somebody who's lived for many years before that, I really feel for this time. And, but I do have to say though, as somebody who has lived in times that were also of high turmoil, and that did not declare a crisis state for every situation, but did their best in that kind of modernistic way of just confronting it and dealing with it, say like in the 70s and 80s, I like, why do we have to declare a crisis for every matter of concern? Why is everything an emergency? Isn't this affecting our mental health? Isn't that addressing, or isn't that creating too much in a way a, a uh, tensions and pressures between the points of the crises themselves and starting to perhaps exacerbate uh, towards, towards a, a catastrophe point. Could that be the case? Now, earlier Latour in 2008 or 2009, uh, Cautious Prometheus, one of my, one of my all time recommendations, uh, placed matters of concern um, on the, on really design's meta agenda. And he, he believed the responsibility for designers was to design well, regardless of the situation. So it's incumbent on us in systemic design to have an understanding of the material we're designing with and the outcomes in systems, if you will, and for hyper objects, as we might consider large, large systems, whether they're scaled, whether they're ecological, social systems, um, they, you know, anything larger than, uh, than, than a social system of a, family, which is a small social system, might be a hyper object. And therefore, if matters, uh, in Latour's language, if matters of concern are complex because they entail multiple references and multiple histories from incommensurable actors. So if this has been the case, you know, why are we switching attention to a, um, what, what, what sounds from a postmodern perspective as a meta narrative with the polycrisis. And yet the polycrisis, or in the way that's defined, is an encapsulation or definition of multiple crisis conditions that may exacerbate and reinforce each other. But there's a way in which it's, you know, point to this is, is that itself the matter of concern or its constituents are? And so in Latour's language, on the right, I mean, just some of these points I think are still quite valid. So design is the antidote to colonization, to founding, breaking with the past, the antidote to hubris and the search for absolute certainty. And, um, it's, and, and, and when he wrote this in 2009 about if you begin to redesign cities, landscapes, parks, societies, and genes, brains, and ships, no designer will be allowed to hide behind the old protection of matters of fact and expanding design so it's relevant everywhere. Designers take up the mantle of morality as well. I don't think we really knew. I mean, even after transformation design, which is about the same time, that it was that was going to that was going to hold up, and that we would be faced with that. So, with respect to the polycrisis, then, and this is from the Cascade Institute, which didn't invent the term, but has has established well in the literature and. There's also Peter Turchin's article recently this year, um, also maybe critiquing it some as a response to it about the global polycrisis. And I don't know if it was defined earlier in, in Sean Gobi's presentation, it was shown as the relationships of multiple crises states. It could take a while to show, to de describe this. On the right, you can see just, if you search on it, you will probably get these relevant terms and the top hit is going to be Thomas Homer Dixon et al. from the Cascade Institute, but also several others and mostly 2020 to 2023. But if you see the search frequency, there is a burst in 2021, then a big burst in 2022 uh, or, uh, or, or 2023. Um, so that's April. And so just this year it had a huge peak and uh, there's been, as usual, a lot of work leading up to it and a bit of a burst, but then it drops to zero and then it was, it's, it's really here. And so the discussion paper, not to belabor it, but that you could read the point on the global polycrisis is a necessary, I, uh, it argues that this is a necessary, necessary and productive framework 
to understand and address major problems afflicting humanity across globally, uh, however that would be defined. And global, I think, is underdefined. And occurs in multiple global systems become causally entangled. And that's really what we're dealing with here is, is an entanglement within futures. That can and this entanglement that can significantly degrade humanity's prospects, um, and that um, that can be. But there's often a cluster of particular crises contexts that are defined when it's noted as the Pauli crisis, which is which are at the bottom here: climate change and ecological disasters, rising economic inequality, political polarization, and violent conflicts which they don't come right out and say war, but so uh, I don't know, who knows uh, Super Tramp, 1975, crisis, what crisis? This was in 1975, and what were the crises then? Well, that was Watergate. There was the first crash in a major government and, and an impeachment. Now, I know impeachments are like every year now in the U.S., but that was actually kind of a big deal. Uh, it was post Post Woodstock, post hippie, there was this uh, era. There was this uh, this kind of decline at the time. There was uh, huge inflation. I was too young to know about that, but there was also this attitude, this kind of anti fragility. That I mean, and you can hear it. You can you can sense it and see it in the arts of the time. That they were, I mean, the music of that time and the arts show that. I mean, it was you know, not a barrier to, um, you know, I mean, the, the Vietnam War was just probably at the time in 75 had, had just wound up and Nixon was out, he was, was on his way out and Gerald Ford in as a caretaker um, government. And at that time, it was also right after really the, the kind of dawn of the new systems era as well. And so when I place our work in context, going back to to this point, I'd say, if you were a young adult in 1975 and trying to buy a house and interest rates might've been 10%, and it wasn't just housing price, and the problem was that everyone had fairly low incomes then, and so you know, it's difficult now, it was difficult then, and it was difficult in the, in the early 80s. So, it's, so there were similar, and there was, it was also, 1975 was, the first few years after uh, President Nixon had gone off the gold standard in Bretton Woods too. And, there, and the US dollar was now a fiat currency and we didn't know what, and people didn't know what that meant. By 1975, it was pegged to oil and there was an oil crisis. These affected everybody. It wasn't like the poly crisis, which I would say to most of us is probably still kind of bad, not us, but to people that, who are not, you know, who are, let's say, um, not invested in, in, in contextual problem solving or, or design for these contexts or policymaking are, aren't felt in the same way as in other crisis contexts. So uh, I will say what was going, how that was characterized then uh, in terms of how a poly crisis was represented, and, and this might actually be, um, you know, a, a very, this is a deliberately simple summary, but Gregory Bateson um, represented not like, you know, a hundred interacting problems, but he, he showed three reinforcing loops that, that together could, um, could create the outcomes of pollution, war, and famine. And these were population growing, technology exponentially developing, and hubris. Hubris in quotes, meaning, well, let, we'll have to define what that is. And I think hubris is certainly still with us. Um, I mean, they're all still with us. Um, Bateson considered that these may be, you know, an, an essential kind of core model, and that from these many others would relate. But if if you could define uh, the poly crisis of, of the 70s or the early 70s, and this would have been, I think, 69, 70, or, in, or, or 72, the um, um, uh, steps to an ecology of mind, but I think it was actually sketched before then. Uh, the, so we're, um, 
So, so the points I want to make about uh, the, these types of crisis representations are that when we focus our attention on a hyper objects of this scale, that we've got opportunity costs for addressing those versus other major issues. And, and we have to consider the best as designers, the best way in, that is the, the leverage points, the focus that's going to make the most difference, how we can, we, we can't address, we can't eat the whole elephant. Um, so we, there's, and opportunity costs grow with the reduction of our attention as we focus on just several factors or, or on, on, uh, on the scale of what we can address. And so this um, reduces uh, the availability of our access to higher potential, higher potential challenges to the leverage points and to different design options. And so uh, it's possible to end up in a state of helplessness by dwelling on the outcomes in particular. That is, how do we address the war, the pollution, the famine? Or if you look at the poly crisis, they're also dealing with outcome states, not causal states very often. And so the further that, that we, we are, you know, the, the, further, um, uh, uh, the further extended our attention is given to the, um, out, to the um, extended outcomes from the sources and causes, the um, less effective we will be. So this will be addressing, we'll be working with managing our comfort within the, uh, within the symptoms that arise in, in multi-crisis situations. And still, and what the hell can we do about hubris? Well, that's probably another whole nother talk, but, um, but, but that will come back. So think about that. So the, this is a world game, um, and this has been running for at least 50 years. So to go back to, to Bateson's model, but also, um, uh, also in, in 2015 at a, the um, International Society of Systems Sciences, I presented a, a co the concept of the mega crisis, which, which is similar, but within the, uh, the, uh, within the context of the Anthropocene. So in, in this era, um, if we're in the Anthropocene, are we dealing with the outcomes from the Club of Rome's original 49 continuous critical problems, which have become a single integrated um, complex mega system of, of, of effects, an effects system, if you will. There are a number of things that we've called it, a problem system, a, a um, you know, super wicked problems, um, I, I term a uh, mega crisis because it all came together as all of these issues can were entangled, but also had grown together. And so how, what's the emergency then? So like there were actually real emergency states in the seventies dealing with like miles of lines to, you know, to get gas for the car and the oil crisis, the, the threat to the, the integrity of the US dollar across you know, the entire financial system, you know, the, the threat to institutions within the U, you know, US government and all. But a long crisis, let's say this has been 50 years from the Club of Rome, let's say we probably have another 50 years with the current framing. Can we live as if that's an emergency? Does that make sense? How should we live within the state? I mean, that's. That's my critique with this. So I say the creation of hope, and I'm with Andy Sterling, who I don't know on this, but there's this way in which different writings that I, I come to from time to time are oddly reflecting, kind of like psychically entangled, but we don't even, wouldn't know each other. And, and, and he talk, talks about the um, creation of hope becomes critical. I follow also Joanna Macy's on this with active hope. And we bring this up, these ideas up when kind of encounter to the crisis, if you will. And now just to show the entanglement even further, uh, Andy Sterling is writing about a pluriverse of flourishing. Since, you know, we, the Flourishing Enterprise Institute and developed the flourishing business model in 2014. We've been working with Aaron Feld's concepts for all these times. So this is inherently our, our vision with the Flourishing Enterprise Institute as well as the pluriversality of multiple 
context that flourishing can have different meanings for different cultures and it should, but there is still a, a, a socio-biological ecological flourishing, which can be understood as benefiting you know, life-based systems. And, and so if events move quickly, and so we have, we have to update our assumptions, avoid fallacies, and find places where we can coordinate, collaborate, and work effectively together. Say a little bit more about the poly crisis. What are the options that are available in this context? So just to kind of educate ourselves a bit more. The original reference that I found in the literature and others write about this as well, Zeitlin et al. talks about the, the European Union's uh, poly crisis. And I guess the actual reference the first reference is probably Edgar Morin, but um, Zeitlin talks about reference to the EU as a multi-level politics trap. So the poly crisis was seen as a confluence of, of critical concerns that were going to lead to a crisis in, of confidence in, in the political context. And it seems like that has actually played out. Um, the table on the right um, um, is, is from the uh, uh, the uh, the the, artic, um, the, uh, the, uh, the main article and uh, showing the uh, different uh, levels of risk so that that is the um, Thomas Homer Dixon at all the, the the types of risk the number of systems that would be in a particular classification and then the scale so the global poly crisis is kind of like the mother of all crises because it has uh, three or more systems of origin, global scale of outcomes and impacts, and um, the magnitude being irreversible and catastrophic degradation. So it's, it's increase in risk, threat, and scariness from systemic risk to global catastrophic risk to even higher. Yet it doesn't sound as scary to me as global catastrophic risk, but it's... <laughs> You know, perhaps we haven't. Yeah, yeah I, I just, I'm not giving it the appropriate gravity. But, but I like Adam Tooze's writing on this. He's a financial writer. In 2021, he defined in his book an American polycrisis, which I think is appropriate to consider polycrisis in non-global context, because we can really look at what's, what crises, what states might actually qualify for emergency declarations, for a period of time within um, a particular policy, you know, uh, a, a policy uh, uh, context that has a boundary. Um, when we talk about global, do we really mean planetary or global political, everybody? I mean, humanity that, you know, that's a, from a systems perspective, that's, that gets to be unwieldy. But when a national perspective, that may be possible. But Tuz has continu continued to write about, I'd recommend, his, uh, in chart, his uh, chart book blog um, last year, Polycrisis Thinking on the Tightrope, he did a few system diagrams, which people are saying, why don't you make these calls a loop diagrams? I'm like, actually, these are easier. This is like pretty simple, just showing the from, from some causes to effects. And it does give the idea of that effects become new causes to other effects. And and it's not necessary to show uh, all the reinforcements. I mean, we could do that, but in a way this, you know, this really makes sense for how it was being portrayed. And this is also uh, generally, um, you know, Western. It, in fact, it's all Western. Um, it's not global South. So that would be, you know, a, major, a main point. So the global, the global poly crisis or this concept is showing up in policy studies, international relations, economics, and in financial times. Larry Summers was writing about it. Uh, World Economic Forum is, is using it. So it's everywhere all of a sudden. That's why I had that peak this year is it just kind of, you know, it's now, and, and I'm a little suspicious of that when it just like blow, you know, all of a sudden it's everywhere. It's like, oh, it, it's kind of like that's the new thing. So twos, um, I think gives a great definition of it, actually describes it in ways that show that, you know, what defines it in ways that, that help us understand what, how we could address it, at least economically, what its impacts would be. Um, 
And he talks about uh, the policies that would feature innovation, improvisation, and makeshift work, and I would say, or makeshift uh, policies. And I would say that's muddling through. And that's muddling through as, as a technique. I think that's important to consider. So now I'd say with the poly crisis, why shouldn't we have seen it coming? Like Greg said, it's branding. So why didn't we brand it? Um, I mean, we're, you know, we've got, we've had a strategic foresight and innovation program and we've taught um, systems thinking, systemic design, strategic foresight, futures, uh, research um, approaches, um, you know, since, since 2008. And, you know, some of, some of our students did. So I, I would say in terms of that is if they had an interest in this, but part of it is, do they have the research interest? Do we provide the framing? Are we using um, foresight in a way that can I that can identify those those elements uh, in, in a way the elements of a poly crisis or a mega crisis that could result um, in this type of assessment? So I'd say in um, as a researcher in the strategic innovation lab, as Greg had mentioned earlier, um, we had led dozens of studies and projects that I mean probably over the years, dozens, um, and with our student research, commissioned work as well. And um, in our typical mixed methods research um, would rely on um, trends, signals, drivers, right? Scenario development, but trends, not the problematique as much. So the problematique of Hassan Ozbekan's Club of Rome prospectus would be the original poly crisis. You know, it's 49 continuous critical problems. And we would teach that as well, but not as a foresight technique. I mean, I would suggest it can be used that way, but it's almost too much. It's 49 I mean, the polycry, it's more than Adam II's, right? So it's, that's a historical context in which other um, trends can be shaped or outcomes from. Uh, but yet it's a historical context that predated 1970 when it was presented and it's continued for 50 years. And if that had gravitas, if that had enough gravitas that the Club of Rome kicked off the Club of Rome with that, then you know, where are the rest of those problems in the poly crisis? So if you, um, and so if you look at, I've done some searches to see whether we've done any work on mega crisis, meta crisis, poly crisis, problematique, and it's most, not so much, it's, it, isn't, it isn't how we're leading in foresight. And I'm just one, my question would be, are, is are we willfully potentially ignoring high risk scenarios because we don't use risk models. <clears throat> we don't use historical models. Um, there is, there's a few notable projects. I'll just point to Kelly Cornett's, and this is on openresearch.ocadu.ca, causing an effect of the, the, the chemical plants and, and um, and refi um, no refineries there anymore, I think, but the petro petroleum, uh, the early uh, petroleum discoveries in Canada were found around Sarnia, and Sarnia is still kind of a center. It's kind of Canada's Love Canal, and Kelly studied Love Canal directly and Sarnia, where she was from, and did an experiential futures like environment with artifacts from the future of, of this. So she made it real. Another student who, made, who took a more abstract approach, but, but used multi-modeling of different time series and cyclic history models, which I'm something of a fan of. So we, so I didn't supervise Kelly's research, Helen Kerr did, but I did um, uh, Neil Halverson's on foresight playback. And Neil was interested in, in how innovation clusters rise and fall and what are the different economic and, and innovation cycles that lead to that. And so his question was, how will, in, how will Silicon, what will be the next Silicon Valley? And I, to him, I said, well, what about the old, the last Silicon Valley? Study that over time and look to the future. And Dayton, where I'm from, Dayton, Ohio, was the Silicon Valley of the machine age. So at the turn of the last century, you know, the invention of the airplane with the Wright brothers wasn't an accident. And it wasn't an accident that they were bicycle um, um, that they had a, a bicycle fab shop because that was a high, that was pretty high tech back then. I mean, they had gone from the big wheel safe to the safety bike from, you know, and the safety bicycle was manufactured in Dayton and they knew that they could put fabric on these tubes. 
but yet Dayton is also the center of probably international, well, uh, at least North American automobile manufacturing. They had over a hundred uh, automobile nameplates before the assembly line, because they're all made in job in shops. So they had they had the first mechanical computer, National Cash Register from 1865. And that was a huge company at that time. So it's so in tracing those cycles and looked at um, and, uh, Strauss and Howe's um, uh, generational cycles, uh, 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 you know, structural demographic theory, Kon Kondratiev uh, wave theory, Schumpeter innovation waves, and other cycles, and mapped them together. He couldn't define where the next Silicon Valley might be, but it wasn't going to be in Silicon Valley. And, and part of the issue there is just that Silicon Valley is driven more by its finance center, not its innovation. There's nothing inherently skilled about its innovation in the way that even Dayton had machining centers, which required that real estate. Um, you know, you could argue that in Silicon Valley, if the talent moved somewhere else, if the money was somewhere else, the talent could move too, because it's, it's much less tangible. The computers can be rented. They, they're, so, so I want to kind of pivot to the point that why this happens and why we are, um, what as designers in design futuring, we are we have a positive disposition, we have a positive bias, as my colleague Greg, uh, Greg Van Alstein had indicated before about optimism, that designers orient towards positive uh, action frames and the systems disposition. So I am probably maybe 60% systems, there may be more at this point, but systemic design tends to integrate these in, in different ways that are unique to our, to our work. And the systems disposition overall um, orients to problematizing and amelioration. So a, it isn't always rationalistic, but it is, um, but because it certainly accounts for bounded rationality and, and but it can be, collective designerly um, you know, visualize. There are many ways that we can, we can design and work with systems together in these ways, but there's a strong disposition towards active hope um, and in, in strategic foresight and design. And, the, and the, the three horizons method is even subtitled as the patterning of hope. And I'd say that generative hope, that is the creation of hope through um, constructed shared futures for futures vision is a visioning superpower. And it's a, it fits a constructivist methodology. It's not necessarily realist. Uh, it's where co-creation is a very con um, socially constructed approach where we agree that intersubjective sense-making can construct understandings and visions that are necessary to agree on sufficiently empowering futures and on potential uh, potential pathways to to account to um, realize those future outcomes, but hope can be a barrier in leverage analysis. That is, it can be it can be a bias. It can be um, uh, uh, a rose-colored glasses um, in theories of change. When if we're going to present a theory of change, which is essentially a business model for a social purpose in organization, the or, and and also for kind of mapping out the out uh, how we really believe outcomes are going to occur. We can't, you know, back in, in, so in software engineering, we used to, we used to, when we weren't sure what was going to happen in our development pathway, there would, you know, the, it would usually be this, the, um, the best engineer would go, so the miracle occurs here, right? And so there, would, and you'd put a star or something and say a miracle occurs. And, and we can't um, do that in, um, you know, and, and, and translate the theory of change to a plan. It, it can't be miraculous, but we can take a longer time frame um, uh, horizon. We can adopt a cathedral building disposition. And so if there, so another framing of, if you will, um, multi-crisis is the long emergency as uh, James Allen Kutzer calls it, uh, one of the original peak oil um, uh, thinkers. We should be planning for the distance, and he and he has been for many years. So when we're dealing with high complexity problematics, such as the Club of Rome, 1970, the or the or the the global poly crisis, another epistemology is critical realism. 
which I'd say is a long horizon superpower. And it can be difficult to adopt that and to have that at the same time. And I think that they actually, there's, yeah, there's a, for, for those in systemic design, I'd consider there's, a, I've made the, I've been making the argument that we can actually hold um, con, um, radical constructivism and critical realism uh, and pragmatism. We can have multiple epistemologies and multiple ontologies. And I'd say that critical realism is necessary if we're going to be successful. And there, I'd say China's doing a pretty good job with their um, achieving outcomes according to the, a hundred year plan. And that's just one of their plans. So, I mean, they're, um, they have longer plans, but there are, if you're going to have hundred year plans, you have to be able to make assumptions and to rely on resources and kind of audacious planning that will accomplish this. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about our methods. And I've been asked to speed up, so I'll, I'll just do this part quickly because I think you've probably seen some of these. But these are system methods that, that co-create future challenges. So they're synthesis maps and the way that they're constructed, created, and then prepared. I mean, this is before the visualization, which is how I... Um, how we teach it, which is to learn the system modeling components so that you can become literate in the system's thinking representations and models, causal loop diagrams, systemograms, um, influence maps, and then decide from those what the narrative and the visualization is going to be. Another systemic method for future co-creation, uh, for challenge mapping and decision-making would be dialogic design or SDD, stru structured deliberation, which is also what we're calling it. Now, because people still are not sure what the design aspects of it, this is uh, from Imagining Canada's Future um, uh, a number of years ago. And, uh, and it is a um, multi-stakeholder, carefully selected multi-stakeholder engagement for structuring the deliberation of, of multiple challenges um, refining those and then voting on those for their leverage in a network so that we can work on the right, right issues that will make the most difference across all of those challenges. So in Imagining Canada's Future, we used, uh, we used a question that you see here in the bottom in the face of intensified urbanization worldwide, what are the highest impact social and human challenges for Southern Ontario now to 2030. The customer for uh, or sponsor for this work was actually SHIRT, the Social Science, Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So we're one of eight regional panels in which uh, we're collect, uh, collecting responses from around the region. And this was Southern Ohio for a critical issue that they were then going to put on their agenda for future challenges that would be defining research within SHIRT. And this is another mapping, not of theirs, but just of another one that I wanna show from the 49 continuous critical problems using the same technique um, as a collaborative approach. This is a student mapping of, of uh, the 49 continuous critical problems. And what I wanna point out here, because you can see it really clearly, is that there are some challenges that might have a lot of dots on them, meaning that we believe that they are important, so they're high priority, and others that are further to the left that have more influence on the, on the more influenced outcomes to the right. And what always happens when we do this is climate change is always an outcome. It's not ever to the left. You don't work, you can have, if you work on it directly, you're not going to actually make much progress against, well, for example, in this case, misaligned international regulatory and monetary systems, balance of population and resource distribution, malnutrition, inequalities, urban sprawl. I mean, those all like were shown to influence by voting climate change. So do you want to do all of those and climate change or just climate, you know, so it's, this is, this is the way you start thinking about it when you do collaborative um, leverage analysis, which is okay, what else should come along with it? Where do we start? Is it actually you know, misaligned incentives in, in the financial and regulatory system? And so this is what came out of the um, Imagining Canada's Future. And some of you have seen this for sure, but it was that what they actually wanted and what Shirk wanted was a top 10 list that came out of a validated process. And so they used most of these. They didn't just use ours, but ours really defined most of the, uh, 
the if you looked at at the top ten the, or the ten challenges that they used from 2015 on, they were very defined by a diverse and inclusive society, enabling equitable access to um, uh, computer technology and um, ICT information technology, governing ourselves response responsibly, which isn't exactly the words, but some of these, Greg and I, Greg Van Alstein and I refined these to make them pithy phrases. But these were, it gives you an idea of like the top 10 actually have a priority in that, that those were from the direction of the left to the right in the influence map. So uh, just a couple of other, um, I don't wanna, I can speed through some of the other uh, synthesis maps. So for strategic policy, we did work with the Canadian governance in the digital era, which is policy design for the third horizon. And th these were developing kind of skeletons using three, horizon to, three horizons through a series of workshops to start from kind of open three horizons mapping at the top to more of a structure. Um, and then finally to um, um, a, um, and this is on the S-Lab website, one that was, uh, um, I think, uncanny in its presentation of, the, of, of where we are now in the second horizon in digital culture. We were clearly, I think, it's almost 10 years ago, in the first horizon. And it wasn't just, and so we were looking at the government ecosystem that is because it was governance in the digital era and the kind of conflict between the first horizon and the second horizon that we could barely even envision the third horizon here. But if you look at the different waves of change and also at the top, the different influence models, you know, we are really in the middle of the second horizon and didn't do so well coming out of the first. That is, the transition was not um, very street was not really clear, I think, but we are still dealing with these um, issues in the near 20, 2020s and up to the 2030s. This actually looks like the poly crisis. And uh, other work that we're doing right now, the um, municipal uh, called MARC. Yeah, so this is about managing and complexity, um, municipalities adapting in response to complexity. It's a, sheer, a series of uh, a shirk funded um, Partner, partner engage um, grants with city city partners working with the city of Kitchener and, and expanding that with other cities. It's an action learning study and, and we're assessing um, training and development and the use of, of um, systemic tools for um, uh, helping um, uh, city leaders and, and work groups within city management adapting to complexity Coming out of um, coming out of, of COVID and social turmoil and affordability crisis, and so these are um, we're working directly or observing process changes in strategic planning, community engagement, and testing a catalog of of design and intervention tools, which we call systemic management innovations. And the Flourishing Enterprise Institute and the Veris the Veris Institute uh, out of uh, Laurier with uh, Manuel Reimer's work. Um, are, are, are um, collaborating and, and continuing with this research agenda. And so, the, so the, the three points in the bottom are really what we're working with directly in the research system leadership and training in the systemic management innovations, developing working groups within um, uh, the cities and organization to cross departmentally to prepare for complexity and using citizen assemblies for community engagement and planning which is part of it. Our, one of the images that we use, and I'll credit um, Ramaz Mohammed for this, um, you can think of this as a kind of the ecological system of, that, uh, of, the, um, of, of, of the different nested systems of a municipality that we can um, map out and measure change from the, the center, from political leadership to its management, the government services, city infrastructure and so on that as, as the levels of a nested system out to the bioregion itself. And we can measure kind of change or outcomes through a more organic means that comes out of ways that we're testing to make this more of an ecosystem model rather than you know, kind of spreadsheets, even though there might still be spreadsheets. So I wanna finish by just talking about the mindsets that lead to this and how we might use that for managing the complexity. So in transformation, I'm putting that in quotes, 
any transformation requires a goal state or you're going to get transformation that is, you know, it's like, you know, transformation is a, a change in state. And if you didn't, if you didn't describe a clear goal state, you, you might get something you didn't ask for. You might get the transformation and that's what it will look like. So you need agreement on goals and that would be for multi-deliberation. So structured deliberation is helpful. Citizens assemblies, ways of managing the multiple inputs as designers, systemic designers, we are working more as facilitators, I think, than as mappers. And this deliberation means balancing perspectives. In systems leadership, um, we've been introducing that with four frames of action. That is, there's as um, the, the leader, as a strategist, as integrator, as futurist, and as sense maker, making sense of, of multiple contributions to work with complexity. And then reframing futures instead of futures as kind of a, an outcome from trends ought to be the matters of concern to the community so that we're following the community's vision for the future. And, and the other side of this is in, in our municipalities and our governments, we should be careful not to take on a global poly crisis if, our, if the real issues people care about are not global. We will be in conflict with what people are, are actually concerned about, like I said about the 70s. You can be visionary to generate this positive hope, but also critically realistic to optimize a focus in the first horizon um, and to find leverage that uh, that gains access to the innovation initiatives in the second horizon using the three horizons model. Creating space in the organization to gain awareness of, of the learning loops in the organization, this is something Arduous talked about in the 70s. The quality movement actually did this well. I think we can do this again with our, with our new approaches and I'll, adapting alternative mindset frames. So I'll talk about the meta crisis instead of the poly crisis. I'll try to cover this quickly. This is Jonathan Rousen's table from Tasting the Pickle 2021. He's got a great video on this as well. That was actually with the STOA, um, but also probably other talks where he's done this. So you could look up the article, 10 Flavors of Metacrisis. And you can also see how they're defined um, as categories, which are different. Um, you know, the reckoning emergency crisis kind of stepping up in state. So can we even talk about crises and systemic design for the resolution of such without the entanglement of politics? And so this gets into how we do this and how we, can we use a different frame? Could we talk about a meta crisis instead? And looked, again, caution, Latour placed on the design agenda, the salience of matters of concern, the responsibility to design well. So, for, so if matters of concern are complex because they do entail these multiple references. Can um, you know? Can we? Uh, oh, can we use the the meta crisis and not the poly crisis here? Yeah. And can we design a pathway through this? And the pathway may be the way we've been. Some people have been talking about this. Have been saying the poly crisis it has us address um, either a catastrophe or tyranny that is either a collapse or a tyranny state, and those might actually reinforce each other. And that those are the two attractors that we're faced with. But can the meta crisis be a third attractor? That is, can we use our awareness of crisis states and our ability to work within them in, in an effective way as a, a way to, as Rousen says, a new set of incentives and design constraints. Oh, oh, this is actually Daniel Schmachtenberger new set of incentives and design constraints that leads us out of the meta crisis. So, so Daniel Schmachtenberg is also talking about this. Actually dozens of people are now talking behind the scenes about the meta, about the meta uh, a uh, way of framing the various ways that we can conceive of a meta crisis that is, which is, which is when it comes down to more of a crisis of consciousness, of awareness, of understanding why we're in crisis states. And so I won't read all the points here, but I will just say, rather than going meta or academic, I'll connect us back to um, mindsets, attractors, and intention. And I think that the meta crisis is a frame that can help us balance poly crisis in managing in complexity. And it comes back to our designerly disposition, but the design disposition is also to never avoid intervention. That is, if we can do something, we'll do something. And as a systemicist, I do have 
bit of a problem with that because I think our, our futuring is often motivated by the here and now concerns of the pain points of the issues people want to resolve and their worries in the present about the future as they are concerned. This is in a Heideggerian sense, thrown concern that is already existing and it's hard to pull back from that. We, in design, as designers, we work with that. It is hard to reframe things that people are that committed to. But it's, I say it's also, also wise to take a, a Taoist not doing Wu Wei perspective of not always acting. I mean, sometimes it's wise not to intervene. And, and or another approach to not intervening is Charles Lindblom's incrementalism, which Don Norman talked about at RSD4. Uh, one of the first times it really put it out as like, when you're dealing with high complexity, we have to consider the, the, the effectiveness of muddling through and, and, and why that's the case. And I won't make a huge case for that. You could also hear Don's points about that from before. But we'll say it's, there's a good reference to this from uh, boy, boy, uh, from Hop, uh, the tragic dilemma between understanding and shaping the world. You have one or the other. And, um, and so we have to be concerned that with us and our sponsors, will we be thrown to grapple with high, com high complexity in a short-sighted or, or under-informed? It's, it's fine to have, to have uncertainty and to be dealing with VUCA, but we also really, should, you know, we have to be concerned about the, 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 the we, we can't be short-sighted by the drivers and motivations for dealing with the um, complexity for, and we have to be able to speak beyond the current crisis, if you will. And can we use our systemic design tools to, to, to do that, you know, to, to work with, um, to help people imagine uh, the longer term time frames to think between uh, the meta crisis and the poly crisis to frame long term futures that that can actually be become the templates for planning and, and uh, opportunities for our visualization.